Are you a part swapper or are you an advanced troubleshooter? I'm the CNC repairman. Are you a belt? I'm gonna show you how the Niagara Falls is full of power. What's the difference between a part swapper and an advanced troubleshooter? Is there a difference? Or is a troubleshooter someone who gets out their meter and pokes and pokes and costs three times as much instead of the guy who just came out and, oh, I'm gonna shotgun it with this part. Oh no, I burned that part up. Well, I need another one. Oh no, I burned it up again. That's a terrible troubleshooter and a bad part swapper. So why do we swap parts quickly? Sometimes it's the cheapest thing possible but in an advanced troubleshooting mindset, you have to think about what is the fastest and what is the cheapest, but what is the most probable cause. So I've gotten the chance to work with some really good troubleshooters and I've been stuck on some really hard problems. What's in front of me here is considered a closed loop servo system and I'm gonna go over it. And what's behind me is a very common machine. And if you're working on a mill or you have a lathe, you troubleshoot them the same way. And I've worked on some machines that are not so common, that are higher end, and troubleshooting those is a little more complicated than these. These are pretty simple. So what is a closed loop servo system? Well, a servo system includes a servo motor, and if you have a servo motor, you better have a power cable and an amplifier, and considered to be closed loop, you have to have the command cable that tells the amplifier to go or stop or reverse, but the closed loop part is right here. So the motion control board sends the signal to the amplifier, which sends the power to the motor to close the loop. The encoder goes back to the motion control board. So it says go an inch. This thing went an inch and it, it got there. That's considered closed loop. Now in troubleshooting CNC machines, usually the problem is obvious. That those not so obvious problems, that's where you really scratch your head and go, hmm, what could it be? So let's talk about this in a obvious problem. We have an alarm. The machine is not moving or not turning on, something like that. And I want to talk about troubleshooting a servo system. So if the machine is giving an alarm, the alarm is probably coming from this or this, like the generation of it, like my mouth, I'm talking. This is the things that can talk. The cable can't really talk. The motor is pretty simple. Now the newer encoders are digital, so they could produce an alarm. Now an alarm sometimes can say, hey, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem. And sometimes the problem is not related at all to the issue. So the alarm could be short. Oh, I think I have a short. So you get your meter out and you start checking. But, but what if the short is only a high voltage uh, short under high load when there's coolant flowing. So that's, that's an example of like, I don't see a short, but there is a short. So let's, let's, let's go back to some more troubleshooting though. So we, we have an issue. Let's just say it's issue X. And, and I think, okay, am I a part swapper or am I an advanced troubleshooter? What's, what's the difference? I'm gonna swap some parts, but I wanna swap the right parts and I wanna swap the parts that have the most probable cause to be the problem and I want to think, well, I don't want to swap a part that could cause a new problem and I don't want to swap the most expensive part or the least likely. So in a servo loop system, we're, we're in the back of the machine and we're thinking, okay, the easiest way I've found to troubleshoot, and I've, I've been taught this, is if you have an identical something over here that is just like what's over here and this is working fine and this is not working fine, you can figure it out. It might take you a long time, but that's, that's the easiest. Now, when you have this thing here and you don't know how it works and it's not working, that's gonna take longer to troubleshoot. This could be as much as another machine that's working identical to this one. And in that case, I'd go, okay, if that machine's working and this machine's not, it's probably not the incoming power, okay? But what if I went, well, there's a different guy who runs that machine and a different guy who runs that machine. Is it the operator? I don't know. If the problem is not common to all the machines in the shop, it's probably internal to a machine, or like I said, an operator. Now I've worked at a few machines where, shops, where the problem happens to all the machines, like all the way down the line, all the machines have an issue. Okay, that's probably incoming power. That's probably, I'm trying to think of something else that could cause an issue like that. A, a spike in the voltage, a dropped leg, a welder. I've seen some really noisy old welders. 
causing issues. Another one I saw, so power related, if they're usually multiple machines. Another one, there's an EDM machine running in one building in a suite and the next suite over, and I worked at both, I knew both shops, had this old, I think it was a Daewoo lathe with an old Mitsubishi control that's known to have issues in the spindle drive. And so they had two EDMs identical and one would work and one wouldn't. And it would like throughout the day give a low voltage alarm and I couldn't figure it out. And so I came in with a scope and I started watching the voltages and I measured between the two machines. And it was that the incoming power to the one EDM that had an issue was like 15 volts lower than the other. Okay, well that's different between them, but then why would every once in a while throughout the day, and usually in the afternoon, it would start giving low voltage alarms. So I was there in the afternoon and I'm watching the voltage, the AC three phase on my scope, and all of a sudden the voltage starts spiking and dipping. And then five minutes later, it's spiking and dipping. And so I go, hey, I'm gonna go to the other shop. So I go to the other people and go, hey, what are you guys doing over here? Oh, we just fired up the lathe and we're doing a facing operation on the end of our long thing and it ramps the spindle up and then stops. Hey. So I came over and hooked my scope up to that machine and sure enough, it was noisy as heck dumping voltage back in the line. But why was one EDM in the next building overworking and the other not? It was because the taps for the two different, on the transformers for the two different machines, one was tapped like 15 volts lower and so it was causing an issue. So I raised the taps on the one EDM to match, the other one, no issue. So that's a, when you have one that works and one that doesn't and, and it's external. Now let's talk about internal to a machine. Most machines have more than one servo amplifier. In our closed loop servo amplifier example, where, where I was saying that like, it won't move and we have alarm X, whatever that is, not related to X axis, but just alarm X. And there are other servo amps in the machine that say don't have that alarm. Okay, so now we go, all right, so it's not happening on that servo loop, but it's happening on this servo loop. So we can start to isolate and say, well, is it, is it this cable? or is it this channel? Or is it this cable? Or is it that channel? Or is it this m cable? Or is it the motor? Now we could break it down even more and go, is it, is it the encoder? Is it the connection at, 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 is it this connection, that connection, that connection? Is it that connection, that connection? So, so things can be broken down, but then you have to go, okay, well, what is most likely? In the case of these machines, it's usually not this board. And this, this is a high possibility, but this will usually give an alarm. And then this, the cable going to it, if it's x-axis, is going to be pretty likely that the cable is bad. The motor, I'd say it's, it's up there, but cable probably higher. And then this cable, probably likely if it was more an encoder problem. So usually for troubleshooting notes, these, these aren't part swapping notes, I'll, I'll do something like, in the vertical axis, I'll list amplifier, motor cable, encoder cable, command cable, MoCon board, encoder. And then I'll do the same thing over here. I'll list, I'll list every option and, I, and I'll work my way down the list and I can go not likely, not likely, not likely, likely. And then I can copy this and say this is the bad working one and copy this and this is the good working one. And then I can go, okay, well the machine has a, another axis. Now maybe we don't want to do Z because Z could fall, but maybe we turn the machine off and we say, let's swap one cable between them. And we put that one to that one. So, and, or we swap amplifiers. That's a pretty well known thing to swap amplifiers. And then we can say, well, we could swap, uh, well, it's hard to swap cables without getting a new one. You get a new one and lay the cable on the ground. Or we could swap a motor, but that involves taking the motor out. And so then you can draw a little picture and go, okay, well, we know, let's see, I'm gonna turn it this way. We know we have an amp and we have one cable going to the amp and one cable leaving the amp. And then we have the motor. I'm great at drawing. And then we have the encoder coming off. And then we have the MoCon. And it has two plugs going into it, both the command and this. And we can start to think and go, okay, so what if we like took this one out and took this one out and moved it over to, this was X, and moved it over to Y. We plugged it into Y and we turned the machine on and the problem stayed on X because we moved X to Y. So then we're gonna write down some notes and go, hmm, okay, maybe, maybe it is this board. 
or, or, or maybe it's not this board. And then if, if that was the case, we'd say, is there another machine we can swap this board on? Or maybe we can disconnect this cable and swap it with another cable in the machine, or disconnect this cable and swap it with another, or another motor. So thinking about the tools in your toolbox when you're working in front of a machine, you have some stuff on the machine that's working, and you have some stuff that isn't. And then there's a whole other level of troubleshooting, which is parameters. When we look on the screen, we realize, hey, we have another tool in our toolbox for troubleshooting. So we could look at our inputs for, let's see here, if I can get to it, for the diagnostics page and channel down. We've got uh, overheat inputs, overcurrent inputs, uh, cable inputs, home switch inputs. How can we add data to our, our map that says what is happening on the one problem that's not happening on the other problem. And so right now I've only been talking about swapping parts that are in the machine. And it's kind of scary when you do that because what if the motor and cable took out the amplifier and now you swap the this to another one. So we've got a whole video about troubleshooting motors and cables. I'd watch that. This video is more about advanced overview troubleshooting, not nitty gritty of measuring motors and cables. But looking at the screen, and then we think about, okay, what if we turn off the x-axis and the problem that was on x moves to y? So for instance, let's go to settings seven, that's a parameter lock, turn that off, then go to parameters, and we page down till we get to the x parameters, and you hit the left and the right arrows, have e stop in, hit one, hit enter, now x is disabled. So if we go to our position, we only have X and Y. And now we could go back to our parameters and we could disable Y. And the nice thing is the cursor stays depending on the software. So we'll hit one, enter. One means it is disabled. Zero is it's not disabled. Now let's go over here to Z. Oh, before you do Z, think, hmm, will my Z fall? Or what if I have a horizontal? Will my Y fall if I disable something? So you, you, in this troubleshooting stuff, you don't take it on lightly. You don't just, oh, I'm not gonna change stuff. Oh, I'm gonna blow plugs. No, no, no. You, you gotta be slow. This, this advanced troubleshooting stuff versus part swapping, even though it is part swapping, you have to think about what, what, what is currently happening, what may happen. And, and it's, it's not a problem to go, okay, my problem. What could happen if I do this? Write down five ideas. Write down three ideas. Well, I could try this, I could try this, I could try this. And it's like talking to somebody on the phone, writing down your, your problems and your expectations and what you think could be an issue will, will really help break down your troubleshooting process because there are machines out there that are way more complicated than these and I have to work on them and I want to help you understand how to troubleshoot them. So I just took that side note to say, before you just start disabling stuff, think about what might happen. And if you disable a super speed machine that doesn't have a counterbalance, or something, you might just drop Z and it'll end up on the vise. So I can just go ahead and disable it now. The E stop is in, the parameter lock is turned off. And if we go back to the position, there's, there's no axes. But on this machine, you would still have the spindle axis, so it would still want to, uh, if you had a gearbox, it, when you hit power up restart, it would want to home the tool changer and it would want to shift the gearbox, or you'd have to disable the gearbox. So you could troubleshoot the spindle amplifier, the vector drive, by turning everything off and then just seeing if you have a spindle drive alarm. There's, there's a lot of tricks that are involved with troubleshooting with parameters and maps and thinking. So they're all disabled now and maybe we plug it in and man, we get an alarm. And, and this, this, this technique is good for any other control. So we plug it in, we get an alarm. Maybe, maybe we have something going on here. Maybe the incoming voltage is an issue. This is a really simple step and this is probably my step one. It should always be your step one. You have a problem on a machine, you're showed up. You're like, man, I have a clue. If you wanna look smart, pull out your voltmeter. I need to check voltage, I'm gonna go check voltage. At least you look smart and, and it's something. I, and I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Somebody, when I was a kid, brought me a camera and they were like, my camera doesn't work. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to use this camera. My dad's like, Eric, you always check the batteries first. And we put new batteries and the camera worked. So, that, that stuck with me. If I'm out at a machine shop, I had somebody call me a while ago on some robo drills. My robo drills aren't working. My robo drills aren't working. I'm gonna have to call somebody in. I told them, check the power, check the power. 
he didn't really know how to check power, and he brought an electrician in, the electrician came in, and everything looks fine to me, and they finally brought a CNC tech in, and he came in and go, well, you got a low leg on your three phase. The guy didn't know how to check ground to ground, he just checked three to three, and maybe you have a grounded delta, or and, and all sorts of funky stuff can happen with your power, whether it's DC, like I said, you check your low volt power supply. Especially on a FANUC control, those FANUC power supplies don't last forever. Check your DC bus. Check the things that you know should be good when troubleshooting. So first step, pull out your voltmeter, just, just check that. Usually low voltage should be within 10%. So 10% is one volt on 10 volts. So a 12 volt, if you're reading 10, you got a problem. If you're reading 14, you've got a problem. Uh, check all the phases. Just, I know a guy, be careful. He slipped with his probe here and shorted out and blew out a main con. Um, that, wasn't, that wasn't a fun job. I, I've been around some bad jobs and bad things happen when we're trying to troubleshoot. So you can't predict everything. But a closed loop servo system, draw it out. It's not that hard, but when you know the pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six. And, and okay, that's six. You have six different possibilities that you could swap with another one, one at a time. Make a map, make notes, turn off parameters. Sometimes vector drives cause servo drive alarms and you start changing servo drives. And then finally, why is the voltage spiking? And you have X, Y, Z, A, but you keep getting an A alarm because you have a turret on your lathe, but it's because it's the first one that gets the DC bus. So you disable A, then you get the alarm on, uh, Z and you disable Z you get the alarm and then finally you go down and you still get this funky alarm when the spindle stops because the DC bus jumps all sorts of fun things I've seen a lot of different funky alarms one that scratched everybody's head was the conveyor wouldn't work and wouldn't work and the overcurrent overcurrent it was a Mocon board but nobody thought to try the Mocon board because it measured the current on the overcurrent sensor from the auger through the I.O. board, but we all went, well, it could be the motor, it could be the I.O. board, it could be the cable. Nobody thought Mocon. So that one stuck with me. All, all sorts of things like this. In general, okay, I'm gonna just finish this video because I'm being long-winded. In general, I walk up to a machine like this and it has a servo issue. I'm gonna swap amplifiers if if I've measured the motor and it looks okay. If it's X, man, I'm guessing it's it's the cable and it could be the motor. I've seen Y motors get flushed out with coolant, but then you'll get like an encoder alarm. This is my last guess. This is the easiest, because you can swap, but be careful. This is harder if you have another new cable, you can run it around, or another new cable, you can run it around. I've seen newer machines with the cables that go bad that are intermittent and you make them and they're good or they're bad. So, some people ask me, why did that break? I don't know. Things just break. I wish I could tell you. On a microscopic level, inside these microchips, things happen. Can't explain it. But what I can do is help you fix your machines, and I can help you sell parts to get them fixed. So if you need a cable, you need a motor, you need an amplifier, you need a board, you need it overnight, tomorrow, and you need to talk to somebody on the phone who cares and actually wants to help you fix your machine, and I'm not gonna charge you outrageous prices. Most stuff, two to 300% cheaper than OEM. So I hope you learned a little bit. I hope I didn't talk your ear off. If I missed something or you have a story about a difficult troubleshooting scenario, give us a call. I love, I love talking through this stuff with people and learning and, and call us when you have a difficult problem so we can learn and we can help more people. That's, that's all what this is about. I'll stop clicking the pen and I'll, I'm gonna finish this video and go work on a machine. Thanks for watching. Please comment below.